Nostalgia critic. I remember it so you don't have to. Well, since we're doing yet another reboot of Fantastic Four, we decided to bring back the adequately impressive three. Yeah, but we're sick of it always sucking. So we're taking notes from Edna Lode about what we want to see in a new Fantastic Four movie. Is talking your superpower or my kryptonite? The thought is, if their superhero team can be better, our superhero team can be better. Darling, you can't walk around in dark outfits like that. Why not? Dark outfits are edgy. You're superheroes! Your outfit should be your uniform that stands out when people need help. You can't all be Batman. Well, what do you prefer, yellow spandex? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be stupid. Oh shit, we are behind on the times. Write that down. Also, how many crimes have you stopped? Oh, well, that's easy. I don't think we've stopped any crimes. But you're superheroes! Oh, all right. right! How do we keep forgetting that? Write that down. Oh, this is hopeless. Look, it's not our fault that one of the greatest superhero teams of all time is constantly botched. Yeah, we're not here to inspire. We're here to exploit. Fine, fine, but what about the family dynamic? What do you mean? The camaraderie, the resilience, the glue that keeps you all together. So that's it? What, we some kind of superhero family? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have to stop laughing at things, because then it happens. Write that down. You are a disgrace. But at least we have no capes. Capes are back in. Hey, no fair. We didn't even laugh on that one and things still happened. You have to want to be heroes, not just make money. But it's the Hollywood system. Literally no one knows how to do that. We're not even making money that great. Well, take inspiration from an actual superhero family. Oh, oh. I remember this. W what money-making franchise was this from again? It wasn't a franchise yet. How did they utilize their built-in audience? They didn't have a built-in audience. Well, surely the studio had done superheroes before. They barely even animated people before. She's lying. There's no way this came from Hollywood. It came from Disney. Well, now I know she's lying. It's been 20 years since the film fans call the real Fantastic Four movie, The Incredibles. It's had a few major firsts for Pixar. It was the first film to star human characters, the first to have a pretty high body count, and the first to focus on more hand-drawn designs as opposed to CG. Sure, the previous Pixar films certainly had storyboards and could be drawn in 2D, but it's clear they were designed as 3D models first. Hence why there's such a focus on plastic toys, reflective fish, and hairy monsters. Stuff computers are good at replicating. But rather than try to make the humans look real, something they really had trouble with at the time, <laughs> director Brad Bird used his unique 2D designs and found a way to make them look exaggerated yet appealing in the 3D realm. So many of these characters look like they were drawings first. Hell, half of them just look like Iron Giant characters given a CG facelift. Plus, the movie dealt with, okay, not a new idea, but a rarely perfected idea at the time, the superhero family. They focused on issues not often explored in either Pixar or superhero flicks either, like midlife crisis, career and family imbalance, standing out too much, not standing out enough, and at a time when we don't have a solid superhero family film from Marvel yet, The Incredibles did a good job filling that void. But 20 years later, does it still hold as strong a place in our super hearts as it did before? Well, let's take a closer look. Yes, yes, off with you. I will finish up with these two. Hey, why does he get to leave? Because she knows my critique will make our point stronger. You just find him pretentious, don't you? It's the teeth. They're way too distracting. The film opens on an interview with Mr. Incredible, played by Craig T. Nelson, Elastigirl, played by Holly Hunter, and not April Bowlby. Fear not, DC will stop him from just using that name on merchandise. And Frozone, played by Samuel Jackson. Who wants the pressure of being super all the time? Settle down, are you kidding? I'm at the top of my game! I think I just like the simple life, you know? Relax a little and raise a family. It's funny, because the opposite happens. And then the opposite happens again. Yeah, Disney sequels really like that formula, don't they? A deadly high-speed pursuit between police and armed gunmen is underway. Cut to Mr. Incredible on his way to an event until a crime interrupts him. As well as Cat. My cat squeak, I won't come down. <laughs> Go now. The suspense is terrible. Will Squeaker find the courage to find this all indifferent? He 
kills two birds with one stone, pleasing his number one fan, a little boy named Buddy. My name is Incrediboy. I know all your moves, your crime fighting style, favorite catchphrases, everything! Ready and willing to be slapped for you. He kicks him out and stops another crime with Elastigirl. I work alone. Well, I think you need to be more... flexible. And I kind of love when it's revealed where he's going, you realize everybody took a break on the way there to stop crime. Showing how much their jobs truly mean to them. Also, I never noticed this. That made me laugh. Are you doing anything later? I have a previous engagement. Hey, wait, who else you marrying? It is funny comparing the animation of 20 years ago to now. The fleshy textures are a lot more... joshua -y, should we say? But like I said, the designs are really appealing to look at. I think this film played a big part in helping people realize the importance of utilizing a 2D style in 3D film. Except how he has no brow bone. That always drove me nuts! While stopping yet another crime. Jesus, is Bane in charge? What's up with this town? Stopping a villain named Bomb Voyage. I can fly. Can you fly? Fly home, buddy. I work alone. Oui, et that nuit complètement ridicule! Very perceptive, making the mind French. Almost totally makes you overlook that he talks! He lets the villain get away while saving Buddy, who also causes a train to almost go off track. You mean he got away? Skippy here made sure of that. Incredible! You're not affiliated with me! I don't know you! It turns out he's late to his wedding with Elastigirl, as things are looking chipper and bright until suddenly people start suing the heroes, or supers as they're called, for causing damages while saving people. Five days later, another suit was filed by the victims of the L-Train accident. Incredibles court losses cost the government millions. Another hero known as the Red Lobster is under a similar suit. Because of this, supers are forced to go into hiding as Mr. and Mrs. Incredible are now Bob and Helen Parr, living normal lives in suburbia. Helen adjusts well to it, but Bob is miserable as the color is literally sucked out of his life. Don't tell me about their coverage! Tell me how you're keeping insurance hair in the black! It's Incondinosaur from Toy Story! Oh, sorry, I guess I couldn't decide what joke to go with there. They have two kids as well, a boy named Dash, played by Spencer Fox, and Violet, played by Sarah Vowell. They have powers too, but they're forced to keep them a secret like their mom and dad. Our powers made us special. Everyone's special, Dash. Which is another way of saying no one is. I'd be comfortable if that was Disney's new slogan. Bob and Helen have differences on how to teach their kids to live with their powers, as Helen is watching out for their protection, but Bob doesn't want them to hold back who they are. How fast do you think you were Bob, going? We are not encouraging this. I'm not encouraged. Honey! That plate had just one day left until retirement. Dash makes fun of Violet having a crush on a boy, causing them to fight. Get out. <laughs> oh! Hey! No force fields! Not gonna lie, I always thought her having two powers was a little weird. It might be the only thing done better in the Fantastic Four movies, they explain the visibility in the force field a little better. I feel like you gotta give a superhero either a million powers or just one. It's kinda like saying the Hulk's strong and... can turn his hand to Kermit the Frog. I don't know, it just doesn't sound right. Speaking of not sounding right, does anyone understand this joke? The only normal one is Jack-Jack, and he's not even toilet trained! Lucky. Oh, I meant not being normal. Dash prefers diapers? What's the mindset here? Bob goes out with Frozone, now going by Lucius, as the two are still incredibly addicted to stopping crimes in secret. I love the fact that the law is literally their mistress. Is that everybody? Yeah, that's everyone. Man, I know we see a lot of common superhero tropes, but were these two movies just watching each other while being made? Helen suspects Bob is up to his old tricks. Is this rubble? We can't blow cover again. The building was coming down anyway. You knocked down a building? Damn it, this wouldn't have happened if Lucius just put lipstick on and kissed my collar. Why does he have to be so weird? Reliving the glory days is better than acting like they didn't happen. Yes, but this, our family, is what's happening now, Bob. I like how they have to hide what makes them unique, and seeing how this does take place in the 60s, you could read a little bit into that and how not everyone was always welcome for how different they were. It's something I think always resonates in a lot of time periods, but at the same time, you could just look at it as a story about a family of superheroes. See, this is the kind of commentary I like. You can read several things into it because it's relatable to a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Direct commentary's fine too, but there's way too much of it right now and often gets in the way of the story. You can interpret it a lot of different ways and it can mean something different for everyone. Except this guy, there's no debating. He was modeled after Stephen King, right? I'm not happy, Bob. Not happy. Wait, you turn that sheet around, by the way. There's some pretty funny stuff written on there. Even this commentary on insurance is pretty funny. Are you saying we shouldn't help our customers? The law requires that I answer no. We're supposed to help people. We're supposed to help ours! 
Murder people! Yes, these jokes have been pretty common for a while, but again, I feel like today they would make this guy the villain. The rich person in a suit pulling the strings. Hell, they basically did later. And that's not what's fun about this world. You can have supervillains, but you can also just have little a-holes who are doing a smaller amount of harm, but still harm. And this variety of different characters shows there's different battles and antagonists that should be fought in different ways. Punching a supervillain makes sense. Your boss, not so much. How is he? He'll live. I'm fired, aren't I? Oh, you think? Now, now, if this psycho kid could get on a hockey team, anything's possible. He gets a call from a woman named Mirage, voiced by Elizabeth Pena, who says she has an interesting business proposal. We have something in common. According to the government, neither of us exist. I like this futuristic technology is very similar to the technology we have today. Though I'm sorry, 3D TVs will never be a thing. Stop trying to make that thing! The supers aren't gone, Mr. Incredible. You're still here. You can still do great things. He gets nostalgic for the glory days and decides to take her up on her offer, telling Helen he has to go out on a business trip. It's a top secret prototype battle robot. Solve any problem it's confronted with. It got smart enough to wonder why it had to take orders. We lost control. AI in a year or two. He's sent to the island of the Twisted Macaroon to take out the robot. Well, I do think this fight could be a little funnier and utilize the probability factor more. It is an impressively fast fight. The speed in which this thing moves does make it a legit threat. And when you find out who the test subjects were who made it that fast, it kind of makes it creepy. Again, the animation getting across more than you might originally think. its own metal and moves is also a clever way to defeat it, as Bob is invited to dinner afterwards. Why live with a volcano? Seems a bit unstable. Volcanic soil is among the most fertile on Earth. The only thing we have to worry about is it falling in love. On that note, I'm really surprised the volcano doesn't erupt in this movie. It's kind of like Margie not giving birth in Fargo. It's refreshing, but a little weird. Is on Cloud Nine, connecting with his family more, getting in shape, and even going to his old costume designer, Edna Mode, to get a new suit. What is it? Who are you? What do you want? Oh my god, you've gotten fat. Come in, come, come! This is also where the movie gets really funny. <laughs> the comedy's been fine, but honestly, it's been a little light considering the concept. But when this character based on presumably a few famous designers shows up, it starts to kick into gear more. Originally, Lily Tomlin was gonna play her, but when Brad Burr kept doing the voice for the animation test, she finally just said, What do you need me for? You already have your Edna. This is a hobo suit, darling. Oh, you can't be seen in this. I won't allow it. You designed it. I never look back, darling. This, of course, leads to the famous no cape scene, talking about how they're more dangerous than helpful. No cape! Strato Gale! Cape caught in a jet turbine! Melt the man! Express elevator! Dino guy! Snag on takeoff! It's a good bit, but I hate it. Why? Because I had the exact same routine in a superhero comic I drew when I was 15 years old. Come on, a toilet joke was right there! Bob is called back for one more assignment, but it turns out it might be his last. For we're introduced to Syndrome, voiced by Jason Lee, who it turns out was the little boy he tossed aside all those years ago. You can't count on anyone, especially your heroes. Apparently Bird really wanted to push the animators past their comfort zone, so as a joke, the designers model the energetic control freak after him. Not gonna lie, I can never unsee this now. I went through quite a few supers to get it worthy to fight you, but man, it wasn't good enough! I will admit I've seen Jason Lee as kind of an awkward actor if not in the right role. But this is definitely the right role for him. He is both really funny and surprisingly menacing. I invented weapons, and now I have a weapon that only I know can- You sly dog! You got me monologuing, I can't believe it. I thought only supervillains and YouTube critics did that! Your nemesis in it! Brilliant. He thinks he destroyed Mr. Incredible though, giving this goofy his hell face. Mr. Incredible terminated. It's a face that says, I farted. I'm not gonna say it's me, but I want you to know it's me. Helen notices Bob's been acting weird, so she sees the last person he saw, Edna, who went to the trouble of making super suits for the entire family. Edna mode. <gasps> and get. Christ, fashion is dangerous. Speaking of which, how did she get everybody's measurements? Suit me up, Uncle Alfred. The less I think about it, the better. Bob manages to sneak his way into Syndrome's headquarters, finding out a whole slew of heroes have been murdered trying to make the perfect killing machine. 
I like he checks on his friends and family to see if he knows their identity yet. It's not really a funny moment, but little touches like that make us appreciate them more as heroes. He gets caught though, and maybe one of the strangest ways to capture someone. It's like a mix between alien STD and a totally spies fetish. And Helen realizes he's in trouble and has to save him. Dad's in trouble, or dad is the trouble. I mean, either he's in trouble, or he's going to be. Yeah, the family surprisingly hasn't gotten that much focus. This is something I think balanced out a lot better in the second film, as half the flick is mainly focused on Bob. But a little over halfway through, they do enter the story more. The kids see they have super suits and sneak aboard a plane Helen is borrowing to head towards Syndrome. Okay, now the whole family's involved, now we're gonna get some fun, wacky action. Indian Golf 9 or 9 are transmitting in the blind guard. Disengage, repeat, disengage! In a minute, I'm sure. You have to put a force field around the plane! Disengage, repeat, disengage! It's about to get really zany. Violet! Abort, abort! There are children aboard! Mom? Mayday, mayday! Zany Goofy! Put a field around us now! I've never done one that big! Violet! Before. Do it now! I mean, come on, it's Pixar. Not every character has to be Nemo's mom. Abort, abort, abort! Abort, abort, abort! Oh my god, just make the force field, you bitch! Remember in the last movie when the little kid said boo? Yeah, that was cute. Jesus, that was intense! Actually, believe it or not, it was gonna be even more intense. There was a version of the script where Helen did die. Lassiter voiced his concern, but said he would stand by Bird if he truly believed in it. It probably goes without saying they made the right choice. Killing Helen certainly would have been a dark risk, but it wouldn't have matched the rest of the tone at all. Hell, even just saying that sentence, killing Helen, it just doesn't sound right in a Pixar movie about a family of superheroes. It'd be like having Brian Cranston in a Godzilla film and getting ra- oh right. Well, it'd be like having a Wookiee Jedi for the first time and getting ra- oh right. Well, it'd be like having Steven Seagal in a Kurt Russell film and getting rid of- Okay, sometimes it works. Those suits really are indestructible, though, as Helen saves the kids while Bob thinks they're dead and threatens Mirage if Syndrome doesn't release him. I'll crush her. Oh, that sounds a little dark for you. It was going to be part of an ABC spinoff, a corpse. He lets her go as the rest of the fam makes their way to the island in a pretty original way. This is what you get when you type in an image generator, The Incredibles Boat. Put these on. Your identity is your most valuable possession. That's why you're covering up one-ninth of it? Mom, what happened on the plane? I'm, I'm sorry, on a dip. It isn't your fault. It wasn't fair for me to suddenly ask so much of you. Again, you couldn't make the argument they might be taking this concept a touch too seriously, but again, it does really show the love and care this family has for each other. And that they're more than just their powers and quips. It makes them feel like a real functioning unit. They won't exercise restraint because your children, they will kill you. Da 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 da. I guess you could also argue this helps give more power to the kids, as Helen, again, really acts like a mother trying to protect them, but also makes it clear they are still capable of great strength, even in the face of great danger. You have more power than you realize, don't think. If the time comes, you'll know what to do. I was in college when this film came out, but I think if I was a kid watching this, these scenes probably would mean a lot to me. But, you know, it is still a cartoon about stretchy people. <laughs> Turn to the right! <sighs> I'm just gonna assume there's a lot of images of that online. There are. The internet's gonna internet. She makes her way to Bob, who's been released by Mirage, who felt betrayed by Syndrome. You lousy, lying, unfaithful creep! How could I betray the perfect woman? Once more, I really like how the humor comes from a surprisingly positive place of Helen wanting to start a fight with Bob, but he's just so excited she isn't dead. And now we're running for our lives through some godforsaken jungle? You keep trying to pick a fight, but I'm still just happy you're alive. I've known a few couples who'd probably be happier with the flip of that. As morning arrives, the kids are discovered and they use their powers to outwit the henchmen. It took a while to get here, but these scenes are awesome. <laughs> Dash running from the guards is easily in the top three best Pixar action sequences. I don't even have much to say, I just get really sucked into how well done this scene is. 
Now I've seen time travel to when CG effects are less impressive than this Pixar movie. The future. You're all right. <laughs> oh, you're all right. We're so worried I about never you. See you again. The family meets up, but they get caught by syndrome, leading to my personal favorite line. You married Elastigirl? <laughs> oh, and got busy! First PG Pixar movie, too. Syndrome locks them up and releases the robot on the city, pretending to save them and be the hero he always wanted to be. I'll sell my invention so that everyone can be super, and when everyone's super, no one will be. It's interesting, both this and Lion King subtly introduce the idea that maybe some villains aren't born evil, they just never grow out of their childlike selfishness. Both films have a kid saying a variation of a line the grown-up bad guy says when they're in control. There's more to being king than getting your way all the time. There's more? I am a king. I can do whatever I want. Everyone's special, Dash. Which is another way of saying no one is. And when everyone's super, no one will be. Or maybe it's showing that Dash and Simba will one day be supervillains. Probably not, but I want to see those sequels. They end up escaping, though, and make their way to the city to stop the robot. A syndrome ends up causing more damage trying to save the day. By the way, good callback. And you know those try to watch without singing videos? I bet for most of you, it's hard to watch this without saying along. Where's my super suit? What? Where is my super suit? I'm actually shocked more people haven't dubbed this over other Samuel L. Jackson roles, so here's the best one I could come up with. Where's my super suit? What? <laughs> Where is my super suit? What? You tell me what my suit is, woman! It's not bad, but I feel like there's others. Play around with it. We get a nice moment of Bob saying he doesn't want them to fight because he can't bear losing them again. I can't lose you again! I'm not strong enough. Like before, this might seem a touch heavy and out of nowhere, but if you imagine the film without it, Bob just breaks the rules and gets what he wants. Like, sure, you can do that, showing passion will always find a way, but with this scene, you do see the threat of them gone really messed him up. Seeing not only how he should value them more, but also how he should let them more into his world, and likewise, be more in their world. It's a touch sudden, but it does add a lot. Yeah! This fight is also really great, with everybody pulling their weight and eventually taking out the machine, winning over the public once more. That's the way to do it. That's old school. Yeah? <laughs> no school like the old school. Yeah, go back to the railroad, you old men. Back at home, though, Syndrome gets his revenge by kidnapping their baby Jack-Jack. Syndrome figures out, though, he has powers as well, and, of course, a cape is what ends up doing him in. Still would have been funnier if it was death by toilet. Violet even uses her force field to protect them all from the explosion. That was totally wicked! Ah, so this town is in Boston. Dash is allowed to go into sports, although not to the full extent of his abilities, and Violet works up the nerve to ask a boy she likes out. Do you know? I like movies. I'll buy the popcorn. Just don't hand me a soda during the funny scenes. Another villain attacks the city, though. The family puts on their masks, and... They're gonna go back into hiding again. It's a little weird, but I still like it. And by God, I still really like this film, because it really holds up. Like I mentioned, I do wish there was a bit more of the family as a whole and not quite as much focus on Bob. But it does make sense he would be the one that gets the wheels going, and I suppose waiting for them does build up finally seeing the family function as a team. Sometimes the jokes could be a little funnier too, but that's made up by the fact that this is a very believable family. You really feel how connected they are, and that creates some really good chemistry. I think it's focusing less on making you laugh and more on how exciting and fantastical having a super family could be. No doubt making the idea even more believable to younger viewers. If you really feel the family dynamic, you feel like you're really there fighting crime with them, and I think that's a big part of what makes them so endearing. It's got a lot of heart and a lot of energy, which 20 years later still makes the film pretty super. So, what do we decided for the adequately impressive three? That you're an incredibly dysfunctional family and they're getting emancipated from you. What? Well, we're not even related! See how he talks to us? Like we're not even blood. We're not blood! Do you see this? I do. Both of you can live with me until the separation is complete. Thank you, Edna. You're a good mother. She's not your mother! Then how do you explain why we look so much alike? You two are the same person! Oh, you would bring that up. So insensitive. You're changing costumes in between takes! Come, my darlings. Let Mama Edna shield you from the evil creep. 
We love you, Mama Edna. You truly get us. Yeah, I'll see you two in the same shot. Out we go, my pets. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, now let's hear No, don't cut to me. Now give Tamara a chance to be in the next up. Oh, there she is. Yeah. Hey, find Edna back here. Let's see you two in the same room. We're too traumatized. It's the same person. And got busy!